Welcome to the Brother Henry and You Show. This show is life transforming, edifying, challenging, and life giving, informative. Your life will never be the same in Jesus' name. Enjoy today's program. Cecil Hall. The Lord has allowed me to be the lead pastor at Grace Life Church in Anderson, Missouri. I'm Bill Hackworth, and the Lord has placed me at God's Glory Tabernacle International in Pineville, Missouri. Uh, we've come today. Uh, Brother Henry Harris has asked Cecil and I to kind of touch on a uh, maybe touchy subject about whether we should preach against sin in the church, and so. Uh, maybe kind of open up a little bit, maybe with my thoughts, and then bounce them off of you and see where you're at. Uh, Sounds good. You know, I think that I think there's always a time for correction. I, I don't disagree that we should uh, just see somebody that's in sin and not say, "Hey, you know, because we care for them and we love them and we do their grace." And uh, but I think that there's a, a greater reality that we need to embrace in that. So the greater reality isn't sin and our fallen state, the greater reality is who we are in Christ. And, uh, you know, and the Apostle Paul writes, I say the Apostle Paul, the Word of God says in Romans 5 that, uh, that when the law came, sin abounded. And so we know that, that when we're pointing out the law, that's what the law did. It, it revealed to us uh, our sin. And that, so the more we understood our sin, sinful behavior, it, the, the Bible says that it actually increased or abounded. And so uh, I'm just going to flip it over to you and see what your thoughts are. Yeah, he said that the, that the that sin got its strength from the law. Yeah. And, you know, the law is more than just a lot of ceremonial things that they were to do, which they were. But the foundation and the basis of of it was the Ten Commandments. Right. And Paul called the Ten Commandments the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. Yes. And if you read those Ten Commandments, there are a bunch of do nots. Now there are some of the some of the do's, but by and large it's do not kill, do not use the Lord's name in vain. There are some do's. Remember the Sabbath. Right. Honor your father and mother. But there was a whole lot of don'ts. And you know what the Apostle Paul said? Everyone who tries to keep the law ends up dead. Right. <laughs> and so it had its place. And we highly esteem the law. But Paul said to the Corinthians, he said that Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. Right. And so what I have discovered is the question of should we as preachers, should we preach sin? That means different things to different people. And more often than not, if, the, if a person gives an answer to that question, should we preach sin and we and someone says no to a large amount of people what they're hearing is that sin is not an issue that we're soft on sin or even accused of saying we're approving of sin right but now i would encourage anybody listening to this to turn up your volume and let us and hear us say, as for Cecil and Bill, we are against sin. Absolutely. Against sin. Now, apparently, I'm not as much against sin as God did because I didn't put my son on the cross right. to take care of the sin issue. But God hates sin. Absolutely. 
He hated sin so much that he was able, that he was willing to take on human flesh where he could feel pain and agony and distress and go on that cross to experience all that because he loved us so much and sin was paid for. Right. So God it wasn't God was not light on sin. Right. No one did anything against sin like God did. Right. I think that anytime we we you know, we, we put such a focus on it's all about Jesus, it's all about Jesus. And I think when we begin to as you as you you describe the Ten Commandments, do not, do not, do not. If we stand behind the pulpit, do not, do not, do not. We actually diminish the work that Jesus accomplished on our behalf, and we begin to take the focus off of Him, and we put the focus back on me. Right. And and so I think that uh, I heard a guy say this once, and it's kind of offensive, but I'm going to share it because I agree with it. And the the scripture you were using, the verses you were talking about, where Paul talks about the the laws, the ministry of condemnation. I heard a gentleman once say that if you want a sin revival in your church, begin to preach the Ten Commandments. And I know that for most of us, that's offensive and we pull back. I believe that's what Paul's trying to reveal to us, is that the power of sin is in the law. The law is what empowers sin. And so it's actually the preaching of Jesus and the righteousness by faith, that it, it, or, or an awakening to my identity that sets me free from that. And, and so I no longer say, you know, Cecil, you're stop this, stop that. I, I, I reveal to you, Cecil, that's not who you are anymore. You're now, right. you, that person has died. That fallen uh, Adam is no longer your identity anymore. Now your identity is in Christ. Right. And the, th the thing about the law is that with all of its commandments, it focused on our ability. Yes. All ten of those commandments focused on our ability to do it. Right. Okay, do you remember the occasion where Moses was on the mountain? And God gave him that tablet. That tablet. The yeah. Ten Commandments. And he came down and Moses relayed the message of the law to the people. And they made a statement. A very unfortunate statement. Nevertheless, we are to learn from it. Paul said the things that happened to them out there in the desert, to the church out in the desert, he said, was for our learning and our understanding. Right. So he comes down there and he relates these words of God to the people and they said, we will do all yeah. that is in that. And then they broke it just like that. And the day that God gave Moses, Moses gave to the people the law, 3,000 people died. Yes. And it's always focused on man's ability, which was God's purpose in the first place to show us that we could not meet God's righteous standards for living. Right. And what we have a tendency to do today still is keep our focus on our ability to do so, our ability to please God. And when we say, should we preach sin? And if the answer of that to that is no, a large number of people then say, well, you're preaching that it's okay to sin when that's not being the case. What we're doing is, is that we're putting the focus on Jesus Christ and his fulfillment of the law, right. which is love. Right. God so loved the world. That's why the law was fulfilled in Christ because he loved us so much. Right. John 3, 16, 17, and 18. Right. And uh, what, what I see in the scriptures now, what we are to do is focus on the work that Jesus did, both in his life and ministry, and then his finishing there up at the cross and the resurrection. Right. Uh, let me read this to you. Um, 1 John chapter 4, and verse 16, he says, We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. See, there's where we've missed it today. Yes. Is that preachers are hounding, love God, love God. And that's, that's a commandment. Love God with all your heart, with all your strength. Right. But he's, 
John said here that we have put our trust in his love. We can't put our trust for being right with God in our own love. Right. Because it's God loved us first. And our trust is in his love. It is his love who keeps us. Right. He says, for God is love and all who love, live in love live in God and God lives in them. Right. Trusting in his love. Trusting in what? That's what we focus on him. That's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. Is the old covenant f focuses on our ability, which everyone has failed. Right. And the new covenant focuses on his ability. Right. And, and that's, you know, Jesus he even <clears throat> preached some of that. You know, he said, forgive or your heavenly father won't forgive you. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Uh, and it still puts it on my ability to forgive. It still puts it on my ability to love God. Right. But then the new covenant says, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Love as Christ has loved you. Right. Uh, and, and the focus then comes off of my ability and my, my focus is put back on, my gaze is put back on Christ. And then in that, and, and I think John even continues to write that uh, you can only love because he first loved you. And so when I put my focus on his love, then I, then, then, then I truly experience love and I can truly give love. And when I focus on his forgiveness, uh, me personally, my, my walk with the Lord, his forgiveness to me, that I can forgive if Cecil ever wronged me. I, I have the true ability to forgive uh, because I've experienced what forgiveness is. Right. And, and I think that, you know, where, where the question is, uh, should we preach against sin? And, and, and in the context of what Christ has accomplished, and anything, if we, if we turn around and put the ability back on the people, yeah. all myself. If I, sometimes I put a law, I mean, become a law unto myself. Right. You can't do this, you can't do this. But the truth of it is I don't have the ability within myself to, to overcome this. Right. But it's the focus on what he's accomplished. Right. And, and, and I think that any time we start putting it back on the people, on ourselves, on if behind the pulpit, if we're telling people you need to this, you need to that, then then we take their gaze off of Christ and put it on themselves. And then what happens is, is they, they're destined to fail. Right. And the sin of where where, uh, where the law comes, where the revealing of sin is revealed, then sin abounds. Yeah. When uh, you and I started fellowshipping on the basis of an understanding, greater understanding of the love of God, do you remember what I shared with you that those in my tradition, my traditional upbringing, spiritually and in church, you remember what I said was the greatest hurdle for people to to receive, to have a better understanding of the, the height, the depth, the width, and the length of God's love? I was it the believers? Yes. The sin? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the one hurdle that people from my tradition, which is a full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, that sort of thing. The, the greatest hurdle they have to get over in, have, in growing in grace and the understanding of God's love is the question of sin. Yeah. That's, why, that's why most of the time when you ask the question, and Brother Henry had that, posted that question on Facebook, should we preach against sin? Most of the comments was absolutely. Right. Which is, I think is very telling of where the church is today and that is a basic misunderstanding of where the sin issue is, of what happened to the sin issue. That is what happened at the cross. It's a very shallow understanding today in, in, in a lot of the church. I agree. And that is, it's just a mere forgiveness of sin. Right. But only if we do the right thing. Right. So it's the cross plus whatever we do. Right. All right. But there's a there's a there's a mis there's an unfortunate misunderstanding of really what Jesus did with sin on the cross. Right. And think about and let me go back to this. Think about the day when Jesus came near to John the Baptist. And John said, I did not recognize him as the Messiah. But then God showed me the one whom the Holy Spirit would come on is the Lamb of God. 
And so John was standing around, and his disciples were there, and Jesus walked by. And here's what John said to his disciples. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right. For a long time, those words that John spoke just has gone over our heads. They haven't understood that Jesus took away the sin of the world. Yeah. So if Jesus took away the sin of the world, why are we given place to sin in focusing on it? I agree. It's already been focused on. Right. The focus of sin was on the cross. Right. Wow. Right. Well, when we talked the other day, you brought that, we talked about that scripture in Hebrews uh, 1 3 that when he has purged us or cleansed us of our sin, then he sat down. Right. Uh, sins. Actually, it's, it's, it's plural. And uh, I think we miss that. We don't realize that the reason Jesus is sitting beside the right hand of the Father is because the work is accomplished and it's finished. He has uh, purged, uh, as John says, he has purged the world of right. sin. The, the issue no longer remains. You know, we think that God's mad at the world because of sin today. But, but the truth of it is, is Jesus dealt with that issue. Absolutely. The, and the only issue that there really is between man and God is whether we've come to a full place of trust, yeah. uh, whether we've received. I, one time you and I talked and it was <coughs> faith receives what God's already provided. And so by faith we receive what God's already provided. But, but other than that, there's no, sin is not the issue. And when I say that, I'm not saying it's okay to sin. But it's no, it's no longer the issue between man and God. Jesus came to reconcile. Uh, the, 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 the angel says that the peace between man and God and Luke, he says that the peace be to you. What, not between uh, uh, the, 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 what they're saying, declaring is, is there's going to be peace between man and God because of the birth of the Messiah. Right. And, and, I, and, we're, and we put such a focus on sin and thinking that it's an issue with God and we just literally miss uh, what Christ came to accomplish. Absolutely. And, 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 and honestly, we want to have, we're talking about revival before we started here. Uh, revi and we, you and I just talked about how revival is about coming alive. Yeah. Right? And so anybody that's in Christ has come, you are, you have died, you have been buried, and you have been resurrected. You are alive and, the, and a new creation into something new. And so to, to continue to put focus on the fallen identity is to basically negate what Christ. I understand that it's a finish and it's done in reality whether I realize it or not. But it, it is important for me to believe that it's a finished work so that I can experience what that is so I can be revived. And then through my revival, I become revival for others. Right. So. Right. And see, for, for me, um, several weeks ago, the thought came to my mind, um, what is revival? And... When I measured what's happened to me in the last three years, when I understood that God was, was no longer holding anything against me, right. and that he came and dwelt in me. Now, I've known this for years. I didn't get the revelation of it. And I'd use phrases like, we need to worship so we can come into the presence of God. Right. I need to fast so I can draw closer to God. Why in the world? Where was the blinders all these years when I when the word says Christ in me, the hope of glory? Right. How can I get any closer than Christ in me? Right. Glory to God. I'm going to get excited here. <laughs> yeah. And I, I realize I don't need revival. I'm living in revival every day because of one thing. I finally understood God is not holding anything against me. Right. And I no longer have to perform to be in right standing with God. Right. And as a pastor, before I understood that truth, I couldn't pray enough, fast enough, preach enough, visit sick enough, hold enough Bible study, do revivals enough. And I was performance-based, and every, every week I ended, or every night I was shut down, I should have done this. Now I've let God down. Right. Wow. Yeah. I, That's a heaviness. But I don't have that anymore. Right. So I don't even know what revival would look like because I'm so vibe now, man. I just I feel like I'm gonna bust all the time, and then when I start telling stuff like this, you know, I'm gonna explode. Right. 
right? I, I have a guy in our church that, that shared with me that before he had the revelation that there's <coughs> nothing between <coughs> him and God, that, that, that actually God is, has accepted him, has reconciled him, that God is not God, it's his Heavenly Father. He said that he used to, when things were going bad, he always felt like it's because I messed up. Yeah. And then when things would yeah. go good, he always thought, well, they're going to go, I'm going to mess up soon, so that I, you don't enjoy this good time because I'm about to go. Yeah. And so he was always in this cycle of never just enjoying life, Absolutely. never being revived. He was dead. Right. He was literally the lukewarm Christian right. of, of never experiencing the fullness oh, of what God right. had for him. You know, every spiritual blessing has been yeah. poured out upon us, and, and that brings revival in our lives and our Amen. churches. Uh, you know, you and I have been fellowshipping now for two or three years, and we, we, we don't get together as much as we used to, but we used to get together and we talk about uh, when people start getting the revelation that Jesus dealt with sin, that there's nothing, what it does to people's lives. And I think both of us could probably have testimony, not just in our personal life, but when we're watching other people be transformed by unconditional forgiveness, unconditional love, what Christ has accomplished, and taking the message away from what I need to do and put it back on what he has done, right. what it does to people's lives. And a lot of people say, well, you're getting licenses to sin and stuff, but that is, that is not right. the fruit of that. The fruit of that is people are on fire for God. People want to see, uh, people want to come to church, people want to give, people, uh, you know, I, my wife and I was just talking yesterday, a lot of the people from our church are on Facebook and how many of them are continually always posting about God, about how great God is, how awesome God is. And, and I believe it's the fruit of unconditional love, unconditional right. acceptance, you know. And then everybody wants, uh, everybody, once you've got that revelation, you want everybody to know. It's like, no, God loves you. God, God is not holding anything against you. Uh, and I might be jumping into what you, I know you got some notes there, but, I, you know, the, the other day on Facebook, we had a, a, a discussion, and you put the, God was in Christ, uh -huh. not imputing our trespasses against us. And to me, that's what, given us the ministry of reconciliation, uh -huh. that is the ministry. Right. As reconciled, God is not holding anything against you. He's not <coughs> imputing, he's not uh, take, taking account of your trespasses. Uh, that he has <coughs> reconciled Christ. And so the ministry is, is, is the ministry of reconciliation that God has ceded from his part. And I say to you, be reconciled.